Hi, my name is Sarah Curtis, and I'm a teacher and a graduate student in the Child Development Program here at Sarah Lawrence. But the most important thing you can know about me is that my education began here at the Sarah Lawrence Early Childhood Center. I loved it. My parents told me that the director of the Early Childhood Center when I was a preschool student there, Sarah Wilford, said, our goal is to teach children to love school. It's a formidable goal, but they achieved it. And I've since learned that they achieved it, achieved it because I was able to play in the presence of a thoughtful teacher in a classroom carefully designed by that teacher. Because I played in the presence of a thoughtful teacher, I learned that my thoughts, my ideas were worthy of respect. That early formative experience has served as a source of resilience throughout my life. Don't all children deserve such an experience? Here's the trouble. When I tell people that I teach and study young children, the response I usually get involves the word cute. Oh, cute, people will say. And look, I understand it's true, but the problem is that word steals away my voice. A remarkable teacher at the Early Childhood Center, Susie Schwimmer, likes to say, cute is a four-letter word, meaning that it's just as unwelcome in her preschool classroom than other four-letter words. Another voice from the Early Childhood Center, Evelyn Beyer, wrote, young children are often appealing and amusing, but they are more than cute. They are real. The problem with cute is that it contains and constrains something much bigger. It doesn't begin to describe the real experience of young children or the real experience of a classroom for young children. Preschool with its tears and fears and spills and laughter and wonder and delight, preschool being the first time a child encounters a classroom is so much more. Or it can be if a child is allowed to play. There's a vast world of theory and research demonstrating the fundamental value of play for children. If a child can play in preschool, it offers the best possible foundation for school for life to follow. There's the well-known Perry Street Preschool Study and the Perry Street Preschool Curriculum Comparison Study. In the study, the researchers took a group of low-income children, all low-income children, and followed them from the time they were in preschool to the age of 23. Some of the children participated in a preschool where they experienced direct instruction, while others were able to play in preschool. At the age of 23, the researchers found that the children who played were less likely to have needed special education, were less likely to have been arrested for a felony or another offense, were significantly less likely to have been suspended from work, and to turn it around a bit, they were significantly more likely to have volunteered. They were more likely to have been able to see themselves as being of service to others. There's the work of Walter Gilliam at the Yale Child Study Center, who surveyed 4,000 state finance preschool classrooms and found that preschool children were being expelled at three times the rate of K through 12 students. He also found that those classrooms that made room for dramatic play had significantly lower expulsion rates. There's research that shows how dramatic play helps children develop their language. There's research that shows how, how play helps reduce incidences of bullying. And there's research that shows the negative impact of drastically limiting children's ability to play. As children aren't able to play in school yes, less and less, they demonstrate less and less evidence of curiosity and creativity. Research has shown over and over again that children, all children, need to play. For play is a child's work. The great teacher, thinker, and writer Vivian Paley has called it a survival skill. Play is how children learn to navigate experience, and play cultivates curiosity and creativity because it allows a child to have an idea, have a vision, and follow it through in paint or block or any number of materials. 
There's a lot on this table, but the most important material is the one you can't see, and that's language. When children play, they use language to negotiate and collaborate with each other. A child might dictate a story, a child might put on a play, and they use language with meaningfully even before they might be able to recognize their letters, so that when they do learn to read or write, they understand that those skills have meaning beyond being simply skills. So when we hear our president and policymakers talk about quality preschool, it's so important that we understand that a quality preschool must incorporate play. For play, as those who study and understand its power have said, is meaning making. It's how children make meaning of experience. But here's the next problem. Play in the mouths of adults has the same effect as the word cute. It sounds like just play, just fun. And also, when we speak about play and all that it does for the child, it conjures an image of some magical child off in a field navigating experience. This happens because those who advocate for play speak out of concern for children and the child. But that concern stems from a deeper reality, which is that children are not alone, and they can't grow up alone. Children go to school to play with other children, which teaches lessons in and of itself, but those children can't be alone in the classroom. There's an essential presence in the classroom, and that is the presence of the teacher. A great preschool teacher may skillfully hold open possibility for the child and point to further possibility. Play in the presence of a thoughtful teacher becomes a child's work because, in a sense, a sort of professional exchange takes place. Presented with materials, a child offers their contribution, and a teacher responds respectfully, helping them to deepen their thinking, develop ideas, understand problems, work with relationships, but never imposing definition or judgment, but attempting to give the child the tools to develop their ability to think so that they may define themselves for themselves and hold on to that as a source of resilience when experience and others might try to define them. So if we're going to offer this quality experience to children, if we're going to be able to offer them quality play-based preschool, we have to pull play, preschool, and preschool teachers out of the trap of cute. So let me play with you for a minute. Here's a picture. It's a picture of a lighthouse. You may have made an immediate association with this picture, much like you might make an immediate association when you hear the word preschool. This lighthouse happens to be the lighthouse in Cornwall St. Ives that inspired Virginia Woolf to write to the lighthouse. I look at this picture and I think of preschool. Yes, Virginia Woolf makes me think of preschool. Virginia Woolf, who is not widely considered to be very cute, but was certainly very brilliant, makes me think of preschool. While her mental anguish certainly belongs to a different discussion, uh, there's more to Wolf than being, to borrow the words Michael Cunningham used to describe his first impressions of her, very tall and insane. And there's more to being pre a preschool teacher than being nice and liking children. Both share a concern for the relationship between the inner life and its outward manifestation. Both respect the primary power of experience and refuse to reduce experience or the individuals existing with it. As Virginia Woolf wrote, look within, and life, it seems, is very far from being like this. Virginia Woolf and preschool teachers refuse to say that a child, that life is like this or like that. Instead, they share an outlook that knits together thought and feeling and intellect and kindness. Virginia Woolf found form for this in her writing, and preschool teachers find form for this in their classroom. To the Lighthouse begins with a child cutting pictures out of a catalog, something a child might do in a play-based preschool classroom. 
And Wolfe writes that the young James Ramsey endowed a picture of a refrigerator as his mother spoke with a heavenly bliss. It was fringed with joy. It takes the great observational skill of a teacher or great writer to see that a child's cutting is fringed with joy, and then also to let joy be joy, not to impose a definition upon it, but let it point towards further possibility. It's also important that the mother's voice informs that joy. A good preschool teacher understands and respects that children arrive in the classroom with deep attachments, anxieties, hopes, and fears. I'm constantly amazed by how children at play announce that what they have created is going to be for their mother, for their father, for their friend, aunt, grandmother, babysitter. How children at play conceive of the work they do as a real contribution, as being for others. And it's not just cute, it is deeply felt. There's also a painter into the lighthouse, Lily Briscoe, and the drama of her creative process weaves throughout the novel. The drama of process is the drama of a quality preschool classroom. I'd like to show you a four-year-old painter whom I admire, whose work you glimpsed before. Presented with black and white paint, this young painter created a series of grayscale paintings, and he worked for hours at it which he later entitled The Four Bunches Paintings. Here they are. One, two, three, four. What to make of them? They're abstract. What they are is an experience. As he played, as he worked, this child said to his teacher, I just knew I was going to make this painting. When I felt the brush in my hand, I knew it. That is a moment of great play, genuine, meaningful effort, and how important that that effort be met with deep respect. My point here is not that we all need to go out and read Virginia Woolf to understand preschool. There's more I might say about her. Her writing speaks to women's issues, issues of class and creativity, all issues at the heart of a conversation around great quality preschool classrooms. But what Wolf is, is a distinct, respected voice that calls us to have a serious conversation about the life of young children and work with young children that burst through the barriers of cute and ABCs and one, two, threes and speaks to the meaningful experience. Preschool is important because it's meaningful. And great preschool teachers deserve to have their voice respected. Great preschool teachers are in conversation with great writers. However, great preschool teachers, while they may choose their words as carefully and use them as effectively, have to do that in the midst of a classroom buzzing with life out of concern for the life within the, with, within the children they teach, always trying to connect with them to support that children in the very important endeavor, endeavor of writing the very real story of their lives. Great teachers and great writers are both careful observers of experience who give form to that experience through their craft whose primary material is language. Now, if the presence of Virginia Woolf in this talk still leaves you a bit baffled, I might suggest that this is a bit like watching a child at play. Watching me talk about Virginia Woolf and preschool is far less complicated than observing a child at play, but what it is is an individual working with meaningful material and trying to share something of what they've made with others. The job of a preschool teacher is to respond to that effort with respect and to help children construct a conversation, to begin a creative, constructive conversation that the child may continue throughout their life. A study that motivates my work is the 30 million word gap study born out of the 1960s war on poverty. The teachers, the researchers, Betty Hart and Todd R. Risley, found that children of families on welfare hear 30 million fewer words by the age of three than children of what they termed professional families. 
we hear such a huge number, 30 million, and we panic and think, oh, have to fill that gap, no time to play. But the researchers also found that direct attempts to fill that gap and increased vocabulary size had a very limited lasting effect. And that gap remained the achievement gap later in school. Instead, what they prescribed was an intervention that addressed an entire general approach to experience. Play-based preschool teaches children how to approach experience and affirms that every experience is worthy of respect. Virginia Woolf's voice is meaningful to me because teachers have said to me, Sarah, I hope you read Virginia Woolf. And my professor here, Jan Drucker, said, yes, play. Think about Virginia Woolf and preschool in the same breath. Those conversations really began as I played with materials, including language, especially with language in preschool, and began my conversation with the world. It's so important that we build trust in school, trust in teachers right away, so that children can begin their conversation with the world right away. I'm talking right now, but I'd rather be listening to children and preschool teachers because I have experienced how very willing they are to listen to me. Thank you for that too. <laughs>